big swings. Well, here it comes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow! In your life have you seen anything like that? Big moments. There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. All the news, all the views. The career grand slam belongs to Corey Webb. Welcome to the PGA Golf Club. And welcome to another edition of the PGA Golf Club. It's a little bit different today. I'll get to that shortly, but uh, really looking forward to having Lucas Herbert as our co-host. He's been on the European Tour pretty much all of the year, but he's in the studios with us uh, having a chat about uh, what 2019 has been like. Also find out what happened down at the Gippsland Super Sixes, and uh, Craig Spence will be in that a little bit later on as well with his... uh, golf lesson of the week but uh, we don't have Brendan Goddard this week we have someone very special we've got Kevin Bartlett as our special co-host this morning KB welcome to the PGA Golf Club thanks Adam Uh, it's great it's got to be great to catch up with Lucas Herbert as well but uh, substitute I've got the green vest on so I'll take the (laughs) green vest off come off the bench to replace Brendan today but uh, love my golf, uh, love playing golf. Play a couple of times a week with my wife. She's taken up golf. So we play nine holes, uh, generally on a Monday and often on a Friday as well. So it's a great game. I, I, love, I love golf. I've, I'm nearly a triple A coach. I've, <laughs> I've had that many lessons. I've spoken to that many golf people over the years. Uh, I'm nearly a triple A coach. Well, I, before we introduce Lucas, where did your love for golf come from? I reckon I never I didn't play golf I didn't play golf until after I retired from football. So by the time I retired from football, you know I was nearly thirty seven, um, and then I started you know taking up golf. But I reckon you know through Greg Norman I, w- I would say you know sort of capturing the imagination, and of course after Greg Norman Tiger Woods uh, who. Uh, I love watching play Tiger Woods. Uh, I know there's a lot of great players on the tournament, and when he was out, you know, injured and looked like he had all his trials and tribulations, that people said, you know, he'll never come back. Um, you know, you'll never be able to beat Rory McIlroy or you know Jordan Spieth or you know Thomas or any of those you know Dustin Johnsons because they're young guys and they'll hit it too far and you know he's got the yips and he's chipping and all that sort of stuff and well we see him come back and he wins the masters but when he's playing i mean there's an aura about tiger that you've you've just got to watch golf and i think uh, he is he is sort of uh, in some ways been, been the driving force why i want to try and play golf now i first started working with you over 20 years ago which is scary in itself and you're obsessed with the lessons in the magazines, the golf I magazines. Love, I love golf are you still, magazines. Are you still? I love golf magazines. <laughs> I, I, I love them all. Every time I get a golf magazine, it's like gold, you know. That's all I want for Christmas. Golf magazines, golf clubs, uh, not golf <laughs> clubs, golf uh, gloves yep. uh, and golf balls. Yeah, I reckon I'm, I'm, I might have more tailor-made Strixon Callaway golf balls than what they've got. I've got them stored under the house because I keep always saying to the kids, I say, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for a present? And I say, give me, give me a box of golf balls. And, <laughs> but I, but it, um, I, I love reading about golf, you know. I mean, I'm probably uh, over-educated, uh, which <laughs> destroys my game. I'm only, I'm only a hacker, but I love playing. And... It's all about dreams. You know, golf's, golf's all about dreams. Oh, no doubt it is. Selling dreams is what golf's all about, yeah. you know, hitting the ball further, you know, chipping in, putting better, getting out of a bunker, new set of golf clubs, new putter. Just absolutely fantastic game. We had an interesting chat last week with Jeff Ogilvy talking about, you know, when has he reached the point where he's not going to get any better? And and can he be comfortable with that, or does he think he can still get better at forty two because he's essentially well, he taking better. a year off the ga- year off. Year I can off certainly playing. get better. Well, this is the thing because I said to him, I'm panicking because I still think I'm going to be on the PJ tour soon. Correct, and <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the same age as I'm Jeff. going for the seniors tour. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to play on the seniors tour. But you know, when when I watched even the seniors tour just uh, you know last night, that. What you see is they're still still driven, yeah. You know, still driven, you know. You, you see them; they, they finish the last hole and then they'll show the practice green, and they're gone straight to the practice green. You know, and they're on the driving range, you know, because they're driven to get better. They, they, I'm certain uh, Lucas will be able to tell us when he joins us that you know, you till the day that you finish actually playing, you still believe that you can get better at the, at the game of golf. There's aspects of the game you can improve in. Well, let's get straight to Lucas because uh, he is uh, with us uh, in the studio. Lucas, it's great to have you here. Um, you're not playing golf at the moment. You have a little bit of a break since uh, you finished on the European tour of the season. How, how is it not playing golf? 
Uh, it's actually quite nice, Whitey. Um, it's been. It feels like it's been about a an eighteen month grind um, out in Europe, um, and it's just yeah, it's very nice to uh, to get a break away from it. Um, go back to being a twenty three year old back at home and doing uh, what twenty three year olds do and hanging out with my mates and and doing all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I'm. It is it is very nice to be not playing. Describe the year for you, for us because last year you went on this amazing run, um, sort of in the in the second half of the year, and you were taking all before you. This year it didn't quite happen as easily as I think we all thought. Um, describe it if you can. Um, yeah, look, it was just a year where I obviously learnt a lot about um, what makes me play well and what doesn't, um, and then also sort of the first year that I've had the chance to play a full schedule, um, knowing what I'm going to play, uh, dealing with all the travel and, and all of, you know, everything that goes with being a, a full-time member of the European Tour. Um, and it was just, you know, probably not quite what I expected it to be. Things went a lot differently from what I expected them to go. Um, so, in a way, yeah, it was disappointing, but then also... To have everything go on that went on, um, and to still keep my tour card and still have a chance to give it another go next year, like it's not the end of the world either. And um, I know that you know a little bit of time off at the moment, uh, which I'm enjoying. That's going to help, you know. Um, hopefully, get a bit of the the hunger back to go out and um, and do what I know I can do and put in the work that I know that when I put in, we'll we'll get the results that I know I'm I'm capable of achieving. Um, once I get the hunger to do that again. Um, you know, I think that gives me a, such a, a better opportunity to go about, uh, you know, doing what I do next year. Lucas, uh, you're, you're seen as, uh, you know, the, the modern day golfer, uh, tall, uh, athletic, hits the ball an absolute mile. Is, is that, is that what you base your game around? Because everyone talks about the, how far you can actually drive the ball. Is that so important in, in the, in the game these days? Yeah, there's a lot of little, um, there's a lot of little factors within, you know, whether it's driving or chipping or putting or what, whatever it is, is, um, you know, like I would, yeah, obviously I, I wouldn't say I'm the longest out on tour. Uh, if you looked at the stats, I'm definitely not the longest, but, um, relative to my length, I'm probably pretty accurate when I, when I play well. So trying to utilize that in terms of like, if there is holes where, you know, there's a bunker out there at 310 yards, like if I feel like I can carry it and it's into actually quite a narrow shoot, like, Sometimes that might be an advantage for me because I can hit it into there and you know have a six iron in mm. versus the guys that have to lay it short of that bunker and now have a three wood in. Um, obviously, like my, my putting stats are really good and I, and I putt really well, so trying to utilize that um, and just you know not having to be so aggressive at flags because I know that from fifteen feet, from twenty feet, like I'm going to beat most of the field anyway. Mm. So there's not there's not a urge for me to take on that flag that's right next to the water because you know I, I know that I can I can hit it to 15 mm. 20 feet left of it pretty safely and then rely on my game to hold apart. So you know every week there's you know you look at the stats from the year and there's courses that suit me and there's courses that didn't and that you know that affects your schedule for next year um, and then yeah like how I do mean, you break up your practice because you know. Players like myself, we go down the golf range and we virtually only take down our driver. That's right. And give, us, <laughs> give us two buckets of balls, and you know we try and hit a couple hundred buckets of balls. But so if you go out and have uh, you know a practice day yep. and you're on the range, how do you how do you break it down in terms of you know short game and your long game and hitting drive? Um, yeah, it depends a lot on the at at the time what I need to work on. Um, if I'm hitting it great, I don't really need to spend a lot of time at the range. I might do. Um, I've got a track man, so I might do like a, a combine test on that, which maybe takes half an hour to an hour. And it's basically just, um, it's it's more of a competitive drill that you don't, you're not really working on anything in your swing. You're just trying to hit, you know, there's a there's targets from mm. 60 to 180 yards that you've got to hit to. And um, that's kind of, that's that's your goal. You're just trying to hit it straight at, at, at that distance. Um, and you might do that and then go and chip and putt for four hours. But it, yeah, it depends a lot. Um I mean, I do I do a little bit of technical work. I I work on just a lot of the basic stuff. Try and um, try and make sure my body's moving well with you know stretching, keeping it stretched and and flexible and and everything like that. And um, trying to make sure yeah you know that doesn't let me down. And then just posture, alignment, grip, the the very basic stuff that it's easy to get right. Once I get those right, I'm usually you know down the right path. 
And then for me, it's just all about short game. Just mm. lots and lots of repetitions on the putting green and around the chipping green. Just making sure you dial in that feel as much as you can because um, you know you can have a bad day out in the course with the long game um, and get away with it because your short game's good. And mm. then you know when you are hitting it well, that's when uh, you know your short game can really help you turn those. 70s or 69s into 65s and 64s. What did you learn this year that you perhaps didn't know about your golf and about yourself even maybe as a person uh, 12 months ago? Um, a very deep and meaningful question, but as you learn from what happened this year to, to compared to, to last year, to make sure you're better next year again. Yeah, look, um, I've spoken to a lot of people who have... A lot of people have kind of agreed that the second year is always quite difficult and everyone kind of struggles a lot um you know they have a big breakout first year and then they struggle to back that up and i think eventually like if you keep going on that upward trend like it's got to go backwards somewhere um it's it it can't just keep trending up on the graph or else you know you're number one in the world by 19 years of age Mm. um you're gonna have setbacks somewhere so um yeah i mean that there's there's plenty i've i tried a lot of different, you know, service providers, um, arrangements with how often my coaches were out there um, watching me play, a few different caddies, um, a lot of different, like even just simple stuff like what you're staying in um, accommodation-wise for the week, whether you're staying in a house with everyone there or whether you're in a hotel room on your own um, and how often you go out to dinner with guys and just there's so many different things that can change um, ultimately how you play that week and, and then how much you're enjoying your job out on the road too because um, you know the one thing I've spoken to a lot of people about lately is like I, I'm pretty sure I sit here with both of you wishing you had my job you know getting oh, no, to yeah. getting to play golf <laughs> for a living and travel the world and, and see the world but then you know I I flip that and say well like you guys have my dream job because you get to go home every night and see your family and kids and wife and sleep in your own bed every night. Um, when, once you leave work, you never have to take work home with you. Like you're always, you, you get up the next morning and that's when you get to work, that's when you see work again. Um, and you, it's, it's pretty fixed as to what you're paid every year as well. You're never worried about where your next paycheck's coming from. Um, there's a lot of stuff. And I think, but every job's the same. Everyone, everyone sees the, the great stuff about their job early and then once the grind kicks in a little bit more, then you, all you focus on is the bad stuff. Um, so, trying to you know trying to find the right balance of where i keep on focusing on the things that are really good about my job um and the biggest one for that is is the fact that i get to play golf and when you don't love golf that much then that's when your job sucks so the biggest thing is if you can if you can make sure you enjoy golf then you're going to be on a pretty good start and ultimately that was what it came down to like halfway through the year when i came home from the you know from the irish and scottish opens i i didn't even know if i wanted to play golf anymore because I just I didn't enjoy the game. I was playing great, didn't enjoy it at all. Didn't enjoy the grind. Didn't enjoy, you know, the, the the many sacrifices you have to make to play well. I just was not in a place where I wanted to make them. Not because I didn't want to play. Like I, oh, everyone wants to play well, but I was like I I would much prefer to. I'd much prefer like if I lose my tour card this year, I'd I'd happily go home and get a job as a chippy or as a carpenter or something like that, where I can you know do all the things I just said to you and. Um, and you know, changing that around again and finding the love for the game again, then makes it a lot easier to spend longer hours on the range or spend longer time away from family and friends to, you know, to chase that uh, that dream. It's fascinating just talking about. It. I mean, KB, I and Lucas knows this. I am obsessed with the European Tour. I know every golf course they play, almost every hole that they play every week, and would love to be in that position of doing what you're doing. Um, but if you're not enjoying life or you're not enjoying what you're doing, I can imagine it can be really hard. So how do you change that then? How do you get yourself out of that mental rut um, to make sure that you are playing well? Yeah, well, I think there's obviously a lot of different techniques. That, like at the moment, I'm just taking a break. Um, I played I played in France, which locked up my card for the year, and I, and I could have played the next week in Portugal to try and get myself into these playoff events at the end of the year. Um but in the end, like I, I didn't know that I really wanted to do that because I, if I had have played well in Portugal and gone to Turkey, like I still wouldn't have been home right now. And right now, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm pretty relaxed at home. I'm, I'm enjoying being at home, seeing my mates, doing all the stuff I want to do. And the thought of me still being out there playing is like, you know, it's, it almost makes me cringe thinking about how, like, w- what sort of state I would have been in. Yeah. Um, 
so there's there's that obviously um i've got a schedule for next year i know what i'm going to play so it's it's quite easy to figure out um you know family mum and dad when they can come out to events or whether it's a girlfriend or even just mates if they want to come for a holiday for a week you know here's oh you know the the there's a tournament in prague next year like prague's a great city let's let's go out there for a week and let's have a great week and yeah i'll play some golf and we'll enjoy that and we'll take it seriously when we're at the golf but you know have a night time let's go out and you know let's have a nice meal down you know down at one of the restaurants in old town or you know let's go on you know one morning let's go for a walk up to the castle like just all all the cool stuff that you get to overseas like getting to do that with mates um you know whether whether that's something that i might enjoy or there's so many different everyone has a different idea as to how mm. i can improve my well i can enjoy my life a lot more out on tour like, um well, it's just well, trying well, trying well, a few of those if that's if that's the uh, the case how how friendly are the other golfers on tour how how approachable are they uh everyone's great um for the for the most part um i think <laughs> it's probably if you went out to if, well, if i go out to dinner with another four golfers it's probably the time that i'll speak the least about golf in my life because we're all sitting there sick of basically people like ukb coming up to us and going how do we transition our weight from the top of the backswing bar? <laughs> <laughs> um how do we <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I think I struggle with, I, I really struggle with the fact that like I, the next day I've got to go out and compete against them and like, and you know, I've almost got to hate them a little bit to try and beat them and then to go and have dinner with them at night. Like I still, I probably still struggle a little bit with that. Um, and I think too, like my mind ticks over about a lot of stuff that, um, we talk about technique wise or, or even just, um, just little legs up on the field as to how we can, and if you end you end up going to dinner and you end up talking about that sort of stuff with guys, and you give everyone else more information that you've kind of you've thought about and formulated for a long time, and then all of a sudden you're giving away your secrets a little bit. Mm. Um, so I think I probably just struggle a fraction with that. But there's always there's there's service providers like you know there's there's the physios that work out on tour, or um, even some of the tour staff. The tour staff are really great. Um, or caddies like I'm I, I, I enjoy going out for dinner with, with those sort of guys but then again I enjoy my own space sometimes so um, you know there's there's weeks of the year I know there's one week in Germany where I basically just have penciled in seven nights in a row of room service because I'm like I don't really like the food around the hotel I'm just going to get there's a room service burger I'm like oh, I'm just happy with that I'll have that every night and you know sit there and watch TV <laughs> What about in meeting some of the uh, the higher profile big names uh, when you first start out on tour and you want to have a practice round? You go and look at the practice sheet and you see, you know, some famous name there. Are you a bit loath to sort of put your name down on the sheet? Um, no, not no? really. Because <laughs> someone just recently, I was reading an article. Someone uh, uh, was an Australian golfer. You might remember this, Adam. And uh, I don't know whether it was with, might have been when Tiger won the Masters, but he actually the practice round there was a spot with with Tiger. And uh, he actually put his name down, thinking that it's it's was actually you, Lucas. Was that you, Lucas? That oh, was me. Well, tell me about it because I remember reading it. Because I'm glad. I'm glad. Look, I, yeah. I forgot it was you, Lucas. But glad you're taking interest in me, KB. <laughs> no, but I, it was a while back. But I remember reading it. What what hit me was the fact that uh, I think you said to Tiger. Uh, well, lots of times people put their names down, and then. If it's Tiger Woods, he looks down and says, Lucas Herbert's never heard of him. I'm not going to play a practice round with Lucas. So he scratches himself and puts himself into, a, into another group. But tell us the story then because it's fascinating. Um, yeah, so that was the, the Open Championship at Carnoustie last okay. year. Um, and I think, so I, I got there pretty early. I think I played a practice round on Friday prior to the tournament. So like I was playing quite a lot in the lead up. And the practice sheets um, as to who you're going to play with, they come out on the Sunday so um, Sunday, I think I might have put my name down with Brooks and Dustin Johnson, and then same thing they've scratched and moved to another yeah. group. So I was like, oh, you know, whatever. Um, and then the next day, next day I might have put my name down in a group with Rory. Same thing, scratched and moved to another group. Um, so by the time I got to Tuesday, I'm like, well, I'm just getting scratched by everyone. What's <laughs> who's <it>? next? <laughs> <laughs> who's the next bloke that's gonna scratch me? So yeah, I put the tiger was there on his own. And I was like, oh, this would be funny. I'll put my name down with him. So yeah, put that down, and then um, I obviously told my coaches that I'd done that, and and they so we we're on the putting green with him at the same time. And they said, look, it wouldn't be the worst idea just to go up and say hello and say who you are, because you know otherwise you're probably going to get scratched again. So 
thought, yeah, it's probably a good idea. So I just went up to him and said, hey, um, Tiger, look, I, I put my name down to play with you. Um, if you if you don't want to play, that's that's cool. Like I've just been snubbed by these guys. So Did you say I'm Luke realistic, from Australia? <laughs> realistically, I'm not that bothered. Um, and he was like, no, that's cool. Look, let's let's play. So yeah, it was. Um, that's fantastic. That was isn't a pretty it? yeah, it was a pretty cool experience. And just the galleries that he had there for a practice round were insane. Um, and the amount of noise there and just. Even it was pretty impressive just to watch how he went about a lot of it too. Like he was just in this bubble of, um, I went to talk to him walking off the first tee, and it was almost like I had to wake him up out of this zone that he was in because he was just he just it was almost like he went into a trance because there's just people yelling at at him from yeah. twenty yards hole, away. Both so, <laughs> yeah, um, all sorts of things, and he just just blocks it out and just walks in his own sort of own world. But you you know, t- when, when I read that story uh, and uh, about Lucas putting his name down, because when I've spoken to other Australian golfers in the past, every Australian golfer has, spoke, has spoken very, very highly of Tiger Woods, how friendly he has been towards Australian golfers. So, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, he gets a bit of a bad rap, you know, for what happened in his personal life. But it seems that a lot of the golfers like Tiger Woods. Yeah, I mean, look, no one condones what he did off the golf course but um everyone probably has all their own stuff going on off the golf course so um i think especially out on tour if it was stuff like that if if um, if it was a golfer now that was going through the same problems like i'd be happy to sit there and listen to whatever their issues are and, Mm. and try and help them but i wouldn't be going wouldn't be going and asking and probing about what is going on and what the actual story is like they get enough of that already um so they're probably like I mean, they're just happy. Look, I mean, a lot of the guys, you know, you talk about the Greg Normans and um, even Nico Hearn now, who I think was on the show a couple of weeks ago, um, and the Jeff Ogilvies, they all, they love giving advice and and helping and and mentoring younger guys coming through, but they're not going to go out of their way to do it. So you have to go and ask Mm -hmm. and, you know, put your... Um, put yourself on the line a little bit to say, you know, like, hey, I'd, I'd really like your help if, you know, if you're interested in giving it and, you know, almost be okay with if they go, nah, piss off, um, mm. which they which they won't generally uh, if you if you ask the right way at the right time. They're all happy to give advice and they're all happy to, to chat. Um, I've, pl- I've asked a fair few guys um, that are pretty big named if they want to go to dinner and just chat about whatever. Like I'm, you know, I'm as interested about as much like their life off the course in the way of like how does that help them on the course um because i feel like i feel like my leg up is not really on the golf course i've i've got the skills that i need on the course um they just they need a lot of refining but it's not mm-hmm. like i have i don't have a shot that it's like oh, i can't hit that yeah it's i'm i'm really interested as like how can i how can i balance my life outside the golf course to give me give myself the best chance to enjoy myself out on the road and really feel like i'm enjoying you know, playing out on tour and enjoying golf and, and you know, that gives myself the best chance to play well. Um, I'm really interested to hear how they do it. Um, what what makes them happy? What are their hobbies? What are they... Because a lot of the time, we're all wired quite similarly. So, you know, they might come up with a hobby. Oh, I really like doing this. Like, really? So do I. And, you know, it, it turns out that five or six of us like doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, so that's probably... Yeah, that's my... A lot of the Americans like fishing, don't they? Yeah, fishing's pretty popular. Mm. Um I'm not much good at it, so <laughs> don't tend to go out there too often. <laughs> um, what else do guys like doing? Um, music. A lot of them play. Uh, music's a guitars. hard one. Yeah, music's a hard one because traveling with a guitar is quite difficult. We've already got enough stuff with us, so um, I know a few of the cricketers. Uh, I heard Joe Root travels with about eight bags when he um, goes <laughs> and play because he wants his all his cricket gear and then he wants his golf clubs and his guitar and all sorts of stuff with him. Um, Trying to think what else a lot of the well, guys. Why are you thinking it? The, the two questions I wanted to ask Lucas were playing with those players, whether it be Tiger Woods, and I know you've played with a lot of the others, about how much it's helped you with your golf to sort of say, well, actually, I'm not, I'm not that far off it when I've actually compared myself to the best, and that may it gave you a lot of confidence. Um, yeah, I, th- I mean, it's kind of, it's arrogant to say that, like, yeah, you, I'm not that far off Tiger or whoever whoever you've played with um there's probably aspects of your game that you're like yeah I, you know statistically i probably do it as well as him um it's just the the experience level of um doing it at, at the right time you, yeah you look at it at any sport and you look at like even you watch you watch afl and like i've never done any coaching or never played at a high level to understand how 
um, you know, how game plans work or anything like that. But you see, you know, I, I remember watching, a, I'm friends with Jordan Lewis, um, played a little bit of golf with him. And uh, I remember watching a couple of years ago when the D's made the finals for the first time in a long while. Um, and just watching, watching a guy like him later in the game when it's, you know, the game's on the line and you're watching him with a really cool, clear head sort of making decisions. And then the, the younger guys are, you know, they're a bit sort of, they're looking all over the place and, um, you know, like a deer in the headlights somewhat. Um, and it's the same with most sports, really. The the less experience you have, the, like, yeah, you can get lucky and, and win a few times. But, you know, that's why Tiger wins, you know, three times in the last 13 months because he's like, he's a wily old fox now. He knows what's <laughs> going on. He knows when to hit driver and take the green on and he knows when to just hit an iron and lay it up. And, you know, he knows when to look at the leaderboard and when to just worry about his own thing. And, and that's... Um, we're all still learning that. We're, I, we, I wish I had Tiger's head on my shoulders to be able to, you know, figure out how to how to go about attacking and defending in a golf tournament. Um, so yeah, like I'd say, um, yeah, that's probably the yeah. The so biggest, so biggest I, just, I, just, I wanted to say then the if you had that experience of playing with other golfers and then in your last professional tournament you played in France, which is where they played KB the Ryder Cup only mm. last year. And it's one of the most famous golf courses in all of Europe, the Stadium de France. I think it's called it was Le Golf National. Le Golf National. And Lucas has shot 30 on the back nine on that golf course, which is the most bizarre, it's just so extraordinary that you could do that. How much confidence does that give you? Or is that like, ah, oh, that's just a day out, you know, it happens at time to time? Because um, that's a stunning achievement to do. Yeah, that. look, uh, golf is so much about consistency and like that's that's my best like you know 30 around that nine is if it's not my best it's very close to it so then i look at that and go that's that's great i know i've got that so is that your now bar I, or? now i need to produce that if that's if that's a nine hole stretch i need to produce that three times in the tournament not just once yep how do i do that and then you know maybe the back nine friday when i shoot two over okay that's the worst how do we get how do we get two over back to even yep you know and like it's it's always about that how to like it's not necess- it's not necessarily improving like one area it's trying to find okay when something's good how do we like how do we get that more often why did why was it good so mm-hmm. we, how do we get that more often and then when something's bad yeah like yeah why is it bad but then also like how do we make that bad better how do we turn two over into even or how do we turn seventy five into seventy three because um, we don't always have our best it's just so rare that we have our best um, so you know it's like. Um, you gotta be positive, don't you? I was, I was just on that because I was watching Rory McIlroy the other day on the golf show, and uh, he was at the British Open and uh, Port Rush, and uh, he had a shocking opening round. And he said his thinking was, I think on the first hole, he, he might have been plus four after the first hole. And then he kept thinking to himself, okay, how how do I how do I pick up four other shots so I can finish even with the card? So even though he started very very poorly, he didn't give up on himself. You know, he kept thinking to himself, well, if I can if I can get you know, pick up another four shots and get back to even par, I've still given myself a chance of winning the tournament. So you've you've got to be positive in the game of golf, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. I think like if you yeah, if you five over through four or you have a a, a shocking start, it's you just can't a, do an Eddie pe- pe- uh, Pepperell, can you? And uh, and hit four balls into the water and pack up and say I've ran out of golf balls, that's it, I'm going home. <laughs> no, as he did in the Turkish Open. <laughs> Eddie is a different cat. Um but yeah, the I mean, ideally and the best players do it as, yeah, they might like, you know, 71 on the scorecard can mean so many different things. Um, there was a, I shot, there was a round at British Masters this year, I shot even par and <laughs> I started on the 10th. So if you, if you didn't know that I started on the 10th, you look, you open my scorecard and I've doubled the first, eagled the second, birdied the fourth, birdied the fifth, birdied the seventh, birdied the eighth and parred the ninth, right? So I'm like, what's that like four under through nine and then I've made an eight on the on the 14th and a double on the 17th maybe and all of a sudden and you're like oh geez you finished poorly like oh imagine how good that round could have been if you had played the back nine well you find out I teed off 10 and you're like oh geez like how good's that even par because you you know you just had a shock and start and all of a sudden you turn it into even par and that's the thing like the the score doesn't really reflect how you played so you've always got to yeah, you might be four over through four, but like, all right, set a new goal of like, all right, so we've got some easy holes coming up. Let's see if we can get it to even par through 15 or let's see if we can, let's see if we can shoot even par. 
Um, and that, you know, it's all about resetting goals. And it, even mm. what if you're five under through five? You don't, you don't then go, oh, I'll be happy to shoot five under. Now, now you turn around and go, no, well, let's like, 59. We're playing well. <laughs> let's shoot 59 or let's shoot 10 under or whatever the, whatever the number is. It's all like golf's always about resetting goals and always trying to find realistically where you're at. You know, there's, if you're, if you've just shot 50 on the front nine, you're obviously probably not going to try and shoot 29 around the back. That's probably an unrealistic mm. goal. So it's always, it's always about assessing where your game's at, where, how hard's the course playing today. Like, you know, if you've, if you've shot two over around the front nine, two under around the back might be a great score if the pins are all tucked in the corners and it's blowing 25 mile an hour. Two under might be a great score. So it's always, you've got to, you've got to set yourself a nice realistic goal and know how to achieve it as well. If you've got the 17th at TPC Sawgrass with the Island Green, if you set yourself a goal of making birdie there, you don't do it by hitting it to four feet. You know, you might get lucky, but the, realistically the goal there is to hit it 20 feet left of the hole and take your chances to hold a 20 footer. And we're not like, we're not snipers. We're more of a shotgun spatter, uh, shotgun spray mm. with our, with our, um, with our shot patterns. So, you know, for a right-handed golfer, it's techni- it's it's going to tend to be like long left and short right are going to be our misses. So if you know that, you know, if you aim 20 feet left of the hole, if you hit any shot that's a bad shot to the right, you're probably going to hit that close. And if you hit any shot to the left, oh, well, it's bad luck and you, hold, you might try and hole a 30-footer. But as long as you don't, like for that hole, an example, if you don't aim at the flag and hit any sort of, you might hit a good shot and it goes in the water because you've aimed too close to the wrong target. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, back to the back to the point. It's all about reset. Like gol- golf is all about resetting goals, and you know never, <coughs> um, never yeah, give up on never on give yourself. up on them. Yeah, now, this is fascinating. It's going to be the longest podcast in the history of the world, <laughs> but that's okay. I got two more quick questions before we need to take a break. Um, you talked about having that eight. How do how do you have an eight? You're you know like there was how two does penalties that in there. Right. Okay. Yeah. That didn't help. Oh, there were plenty of eights. And we, yeah, but when you, yeah, but it's you're not looking It's easy to have an eight. It's easy to have an eight. Let but, me tell but you. But when you have an eight, I know you've sort of half answered the question. How angry are you? Or like, do you just get furious? Because I know I want to walk off if I have an eight. And because this is in a golf tournament where it's played over four days, yeah. how can that not keep coming back into your mind about that eight? Um, it depends a lot on how you've done it. Um, if you've made dumb mistakes that you've made before and you should have learned from, I think that's when you get the angriest. Um, to that eight, for example, like I've I just hit a really poor tee shot off the tee that it's gone on the wind and it finished in a gorse bush somewhere and I've had to take an unplayable, and then I've hit that shot from there off an awkward lie right into some trees, never found the ball, so I've had to go back to where I was, hit that just off the edge of the green, chipped it and missed the putt. So, like you take the two penalties out of it, and it kind of wasn't really that bad of a hole. Like you, pro- I think I would have made a bogey. Um with no penalties in there. So you can't get, it's, it's sort of hard. The same thing. Like I played the Dunhill links, um, about a month ago and playing Carnoustie and I'm sitting at 11 under. Oh, so yes, the cuts, yeah. the cuts at the end of the third round. So yeah. I've got four holes to go in the third round and I'm around Carnoustie. I must've been four or five under bogey free. Yeah. You're top 15. So, yeah. Like play, pretty good spot in the tournament playing really nicely. All of a sudden, you get up to the par five or six with the out of bounds all down the left. First one goes out of bounds. The second one is obviously a, we're not hitting this out of bounds again shot, so it's in the right rough. Then I hit a poor second shot, goes on the wind, out of bounds again. Hit the poor next shot into the hazard, hit on the front edge, two putt for a ten. All of a sudden, like where did that just come from? And you sort of you, like yeah, you're angry for a little bit, um, a bit easier for us because we're playing a tournament every week. So you're sort of like, all right, well, I won't do that next week. Mm, yeah. um, but it just it like it happens. You, <laughs> It's a game that's always got a botch on the bum, isn't it? Oh, if like if I held a gun to your head, KB, and said like you can if if you ever make a triple again, this gun's going off. Like you couldn't you couldn't make that bet. You couldn't go, yeah, yeah right, that's that's fair because it's just it's going to happen. Like yeah. golf happens all the time. Golf just it, it's just it's one I was, of those sports. I was sports. watching uh, Bernard uh, Langer play in Montgomery in the seniors tour last week, and uh, they had a playoff and. Um, it took him four to get on the playoff hole. It took him four to get out of the the bunker on the side of the green. Yeah, and we uh, sit there and go like, "How could you? Put, how could it, that possibly?" He had a shocking lie, and then he couldn't get out. Then it came back virtually the same spot. Couldn't he, he had four to get out? But you know what? His demeanour did not change. No. Demeanour did not change. I imagine Nick Kyrgios in that situation. Yeah, he just got out. He just got out of the bunker, went up, and then you know, uh, tapped. I can nearly guarantee he, he there would have been a, he gave, he gave it to Montgomery. There would have been a few cursed German words under his breath, <laughs> though, I reckon. But just looking at him, yeah. uh, he just 
He accepted the fact that that's, <clears throat> that's golf and it's going to bite you sometimes. And unfortunately, it bit him by getting a bad lie in, in the bunker on the playoff hole. So what do we expect, Lucas, uh, this summer? You're obviously back. You'll be refreshed, uh, ready to go. You've got the Australian Open, um, the PGA. There's a few tournaments to come here in Australia where we get to see you play. What are the expectations? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm really looking forward to the Australian Open. I love the Australian Golf Club in Sydney. Um, and we've got a great field this year, obviously with a lot of the guys from the President's Cup team coming out to play. Um, and I think a fair few... Well, I mean, the Australian guys are playing the President's Cup as well, but um, we've got all of our really good players back um, mm. playing. It's going to be a really good event. Um, and, yeah, I love that golf course. So I'm really looking forward to that week. And I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure where I've got my expectations at the moment. Um, it's going to depend on what sort of form I bring into that week. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm playing great, if I come out Thursday and I'm playing great, reset those goals and like, well, why can't we win this week? But, but, but if you I'm, must go, if, surely, Lucas, you're good enough to go into any tournament you play with the, with the idea, I can win this tournament. Because we see it every week where there's first-time winners on the, on the US PGA, they come out of the web.com, we see it all around the world, European tour. So when you get to your level and can play the game at your level, surely every time you go into a tournament, I'm in this to win it. Well, yes and no. Is it's a tough question because, what like, <clears throat> for the if, to take the Australian Open for example, like whether I whether I win the tournament or not is yes, it's all it's it's on me. If I play well, there's no reason why I can't. Yeah. But if I don't play well, I'm probably going to struggle to do it. So that's where your expectation management is, and that's where you reset your goals. Like yeah. Thursday morning, but, I'm five but, over through nine. Winning the golf tournament is not my goal anymore. Like, let's get this back to even par by nine holes into the second round. But then, my, my but then for the second round, your goal might be I can still win this tournament. Well, if, you know, hopefully you reset those mini goals yeah. and you, and hopefully you keep ticking them off and you get yourself back into a position where, like, yeah, we can win the golf tournament. But if you're five over through nine, you probably haven't. You're probably not playing your best golf. Mm. So that's where an expectation management level comes in as well because. If you keep thinking you're going to win the golf tournament at five over, you know, if you finish at five over in the first round and, and still think, oh, I'm going to win this golf tournament, you're mm-hmm. probably going to get let down a lot of times. And dealing with that can often be hard. And, you know, you don't want to keep repeating a failure on yourself. You know, mm-hmm. you don't want to keep thinking in your own head, oh, I'm a failure because I didn't win the tournament. Well, yeah, you set yourself a pretty hard task there. Well, you can't the win every week, but I, I just, I would think. You know, sometimes a, sometimes a win in that, situa- a win in that situation might be making this. the cut. You know, a, mm-hmm. like some weeks a win is making the cut because you're playing that poorly. You've got your game, you, you know, you've got absolutely everything you could out of your game. Mm. And that can be a win. And then some weeks, like, you might run top five and go, you know what, I should have won that. There's no way I should have lost that go- mm. lost that golf tournament. Um, you know, that's just the game of golf. And, uh, and yeah, I, but to answer your question, like, yeah, every, mo- like, I don't think there's too many tournaments and I'm turning up to going, like, if I play my best golf here, there's no reason why I can't win. Just that, uh, I can remember seeing uh, an interview with, um, with Arnold Palmer when he was, you know, in his 50s, and uh, he was still playing the Masters. And uh, they said him, what's your expectations? And he said, I've never come to a golf tournament not thinking I can't win. Mm. Now, what was his chances of winning at 50? Well, they're probably pretty slim. But in his own mind, I'm, I'm going to come here thinking I can win, and I'll get the best out of myself because I've got that positive attitude. But that was his attitude. I, every tournament I come to, I think I can win. But I think that's the beauty of golf is that so many different sets of circumstances present every week. And Tyrrell Hatton won in Turkey just uh, overnight and he had a sore wrist. And I think he didn't think he was going to win going into the final round because he, he'd been playing well, but he had this wrist issue and his expectations dropped and he probably played better. And he's someone that puts such Beware high expectations the golf, on himself every week. So very interesting. Look, we've got to take a break. I'm not sure how this we might this might have to be put into two parts this uh, <laughs> podcast, but we're going to talk about the Gibson. The guest is so good. Yeah, part, oh, it's <coughs> absolutely it's awesome. We'd it's have part awesome. one KB's golf tips. That's right. Part exactly two, right. Anything else in the show? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> the Gippsland Super Sixes were held uh, in Country Victoria um, over the weekend, and it was really wet and really wild. But uh, we'll talk to the winner after this. Everything you want to know about Aussie golf is in one place. 
pga.org.au. This is the official site of the PGA of Australia. It's the one website loaded with all the tournament, course and player news. That includes the latest on the ISPS Handa PGA Tour of Australasia. The Finder PGA Pro directory will track down the pros near you. And here's where you can live stream golf's best on PGA TV. Watching tournaments live, streaming replays or watching the latest reports on Aussie golfers around the world. There are even video tips from the pros. So if golf's your game, this is your site. pga.org.au From the Professional Golfers Association of Australia. Driving Australian golf since 1911. Yes, welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. Now, I mentioned before the break that we had uh, the the Gippsland Super Sixes over the weekend. Unfortunately, uh, rain played havoc, but it didn't bother Tom Powerhorn because uh, he won, and uh, there's plenty of good things that happen as, as a result of him winning down in Gippsland over the weekend, and he joins us now. Tom, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me. How do you feel? How do you feel uh, after winning that, and, and what, what sort of impact is that going to have on your young golf career? Um, no, it feel, uh, feels great. Pretty relieved, I guess. It was a, a long week up and down stopping and starting um but yeah very relieved at the end you know we just finished um just before it got dark which was great um for me like i've gone from really no status i was i wasn't really playing much no tournaments at all so it's gone from yeah no status to full status in australasia which is great tom does it feel like a bit of an odd uh victory given that you guys were just on and off the course so much through the week like do you feel like it would have been a bit more normal had the tournament played out uh, to its normal format and you had a one? Um, yeah, having yeah, it, it definitely for sure. Having said that, with the Super Six format, was going to be a bit different. It ended up just being normal stroke play. Yeah. But yeah, very different. Like you know, we were playing pretty quick the last round just to finish um, before darkness, and it was a shotgun start. So very, very different format. Normally, more of a format you'd see in amateur golf. So yeah, it felt a bit different. That's for sure. So explain when you realised that the actual, so the, the match play format wasn't going to happen because, as you said, you're on and off all week. It was it was terribly unlucky, the, the weather forecast. Um, but did you have to change the way you played or it was just about just trying to get the ball in the hole? Um, well, yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're always trying your best. I think it was, so, it was because it kept raining, even on Sunday it was raining. I, to be honest, I didn't think we are actually going to play the third round, I thought. There was a good chance it was just going to be the two rounds, um, which doesn't make an official event. Um, so you know that was a bit of a bummer. But then you know, to the to the PJ's credit, they you know we just got in time. So it was only until about probably an hour and a half before the final round, which teed off about four o'clock, did I actually think there was going to be a third round. So very different, yeah. Man, I um, <clears throat> I, I saw you. I reckon I saw you at Spring Valley last year in about October. And I remember yeah. chatting to you, and you sort of were like, "Oh, I no, don't really, not really interested in playing that much. Just want to work on my swing." And you're sort of going down a path that a lot, you know, a lot of people would have said, "Oh, this could, uh, this could end pretty badly here." Um, is it nice to kind of go down the route that you did with with working on the game the way you wanted to, and approaching it the way you did to to come out with a success like this and actually probably uh, prove some people wrong? Um, yeah, well, it was good. To be honest, like, I went down that path and then probably I was just work- I had no money, so that was kind of an issue as well. And then I was just I was just working a lot. And then I was playing trash, like, as well. I had a few other things going on and just didn't... Um, yeah, I was, I was practicing a bit and then kind of just waiting for it to build. And then I ended up um, caddying... Um, overseas for like I ended up spending 10 weeks overseas not playing at all and when I came back I was kind of like oh let's just try and you know try and play a bit more not even just for tournaments just so I can actually enjoy golf again so you know I did I was working on my swing but I did kind of abandon that and then so it's gone full circle really what about with uh, with match play uh, even though it was uh, that part of uh, the tournament uh, wasn't completed are you a good match play player do you like playing match play I thought it was okay. Like we played a lot of um, when we we're amateurs. Like uh, Lucas would know, we played. We won two interstate series there. And, he was a good uh, match player. Is yeah, he? Not too bad. Is it a I different mindset? The, I was always down the order. So, but uh, we played well in pennant. So I felt pretty confident. Um, 
So, yeah, yeah, which I think it's a great format because you can be a bit more aggressive. Normally, mm. stroke play, you're a bit more hesitant, but a match play, yeah, very exciting. So you need a different mindset to play match play as compared to stroke play. Yeah, I think you'll find if you watch golf tournaments that are match play, you know, players play really well because, you know, you're not afraid of making a double or a triple. You're really, you know, you're going to be more aggressive off the tee and make a lot of birdies for sure, yeah. Mate, how's that changed the plans for the rest of the year? What were you, uh, what were you planning on doing, and what uh, what have you thought about changing around now? Um, well, I just at the start I entered, um, I just entered Vic PGA, which was a couple of weeks ago, and this week, and sort of just see how I was going to go. And then I played okay at Vic PGA and entered um, a few tournaments, literally the Thursday last week. But I had to pre qualify. I was, I was going to go pre qualify. I had to go back. To, I was going to go to first major Q school. And then now I like, get into all the events that I had to pre that I was going to pre qualify and don't have to go to Q school, so it's, uh, it's changed quite dramatically. It's amazing. It's an amazing game changer what you've experienced just from yesterday. How many times did you think about it down the last three or four holes, knowing what was at stake if you were able to hold on? Yeah, like well, I, yeah, I wouldn't even say the last three holes. I'd probably say the last uh, at least eighteen. I uh, definitely the last round for the whole day. Um, you know, I was just I was just hoping to finish top ten um, to get a start in the next event, which you know, which was which I thought would be great. And then uh, after about four holes in the last round, I thought you know I was going okay. I was like I've probably got the top ten locked up. Let's let's try and do a little bit better. So um, yeah, it's funny how it all changes. It just cha- yeah, it changes so quickly. And I feel like that's probably changed his uh, weekend plans next weekend with uh, probably a little bit more alcohol involved now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mate, how nice did it feel to uh, hold that 25-footer on 17 to give yourself that two-shot buffer going down the last? Yeah, I think that was that was really pivotal. You know, it was one of those ones you kind of just trying to roll it up and hope for the best. I, uh, I don't think I really hold anything outside, you know, 10 or 15 feet for the whole week. And when I went in, it was, yeah, a bit of a shock. So it was great. Honestly, it gives you that... You know, it's such a big difference, one to two shots. So, you know, much more comfortable playing the last hole. It's a, it was a strongish field. Um, you've beaten the field. What does that do, not so much now for your opportunities, but for your confidence as a golfer trying to make it as a professional? Um, yeah, I think it, I, it yeah, obviously helps. I've always been one more so, like, sort of looked within myself to see how I'm performing. I, I try not to compare too much um, uh, to others and, but yeah, like you know, to be able to hit some really nice shots and play play how I'd like really gives me a lot of confidence going forward. Tom, I'm just a hacker, and I've been trying to, uh, you know, uh, pick the brains of of Lucas here. Um, <laughs> on my backswing, <laughs> when I get the top of my backswing, what should I be thinking about is, in terms of my downswing? Tom is the person to ask too. He knows way more about a golf. I, I want to know, do. you know, should I be pushing off with my right leg? Should I be trying to spin out with my right hip? How do how do I get you know my my the torso facing the facing the target line and getting the lag on my club so I can come down and hit it like a pro? I've gone full circle. I, you know, probably if, if you asked me a year ago, I'd probably give you that 12, 12 tips. You know, all um, all uh, different to each other. But now I'm probably just one. You know, just just hit it and hope for the best. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I do. But it I was expecting this it, it expensive work. answer. It doesn't <laughs> work stop. very well. I don't know whether I should be pushing off with my right leg because they oh, keep saying you've got to turn your bottom half before your top half. Now, that's a, when I think about that, I'm at the top of my backswing and I'm thinking to myself, now I've got to turn my bottom half of my body. So you understand yeah. where I'm coming from? I mean, it's, I, I, it's I, not I easy. Understand. I can understand. You definitely, definitely need some uh, need to see a uh, in person PJ pro. I recommend, and maybe then to the psychologist. No, I want to come and see you. I want to come and see you, Tom. You're the winner. <laughs> I'm happy to have have a hit with you at the range. No time. Uh, he, he charges now. He's a PJ winner. Yeah, I'm a PJ member again now. So yeah, uh, terrific, Tom. Congratulations. Uh, sensational to to see you have that breakthrough victory and and all that comes with it. Now, um, hopefully, it means uh, bigger and better things to come. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Well done, mate. Well played. Tom Powerhorn winning in Gippsland on the PGA Tour. Now, we're going to take a break, and this is where KB is just going to get into, coming to his own here. We've actually got Craig Spence coming in to give us a golf lesson.
Now, this could go for a long time because I know you've got plenty of questions. I'll put on my tape recorder. <laughs> we'll do that next on the PJ Golf Club. Lucas Herbert, our special co-host. RSN Podcast, all your favourite RSN shows and loads of new programs. You can listen all download wherever, whenever. And now we're on iHeartRadio, the world's number one radio and podcast app. RSN Podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts and at rsn.net.au. And now on iHeartRadio. It's free at your app store or head to iHeart.com. And welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. Craig Spence uh, has come in again with his tip that makes everyone, including me, play better. Welcome back again. Adam, good to see you again. Under pressure as usual. You set homework for I me. I did but set I'm, homework. Uh... Now, KB doesn't know this. Now, KB, I set Craig some homework and I wanted him to talk to us about alignment because I reckon there's a lot of times when you play golf where you're playing with a playing partner that's Lining up Everyone the ball two right. fairways away. Everyone aims right. And the question always is, do you ask them, do you know where you're aiming? Or do you just don't say anything and let them hit the ball <laughs> way out to you the right? don't say anything. <laughs> so, how, how, how do you go with aim, KB? I'm very poor at aiming too. I'm, yep. always, I'm always aiming right. Yep. I remember many years ago, I uh, had a lesson, a couple of lessons from Rowan Dummett. Yes. And he said to me, you know, come around to the left, come around to the left. And I kept saying to him, mate, if I come around to the left, this is when he was down at Albert Park, I said, I'm going to hit this ball out on the road. And he said, he said, no, you're not. You're lined up correctly. I said, I'm not lined up correctly. He said, yes, you are. And he was right. Well, KB, why do you think golf's so difficult to aim versus other sports? Like, you played a lot of footy, obviously. Good Footy's question. not hard to aim, is it? You can aim... Why do you think golf's so difficult? I think because you're, you're side on. Yes. You're side right. on. If you, if you can face something, you know, you can sort of line yourself up. But as soon as you get side on, yep. you tend to want to, you're looking over your left shoulder and you're always looking to the right of your left shoulder. Yep. I always say that imagine playing darts from side on or pool, shooting pool side on. You'd, you'd barely make contact with the white ball, would you? Yeah, that's exactly right. And golf's a bit like that. You're standing side on to this, this round ball trying to hit it in a straight line, swinging in a circle, and it's a, it's a very, very difficult part of the game. So what, I'll ask Lucas the same question, but what, what were some of the things that you did as a player and yep. then also some of the things that you do when you coach your students to sort of some triggers or some, some tips to make it as easy as possible? Well, first thing you have to do is start to practice the right way. And I'll be interested, Lucas, straight away, do you practice aim every week on tour or regularly when you're, when you're playing tournaments? Yeah, so for me, alignment is one of the very basic things that it's quite easy to get right, yeah. in my opinion. Um, so pretty much like my weekly routine would basically revolve around either Monday or Tuesday when I first get to the range for the week. I'll probably spend half an hour with an alignment stick down, um, definitely an alignment stick down for my feet. Yep. And then usually one just next to the ball for my club as well to get the, the club face um, aligned square. Yep. Because for me, if I hit, um, if I'm playing poorly, a lot of the time it comes from very simple things like alignment or ball position or that kind of thing. So I, <clears throat> my theory is always, if I can get my alignment absolutely spot on, that's one thing that I don't have to worry about. And then, so I might do that Monday or Tuesday, play for a couple of days. And then maybe after the round on Thursday or Friday, I'll just go back and, and do yep. that again so that you... You know, you might you might sway away from that a little bit um, through the week, and you don't want to worry about it too much out in the course. But but you want to have practiced it enough um, prior to going out that yep. you don't have to think about it. And obviously, Adam, for our average punter out there, he's got a nine to five job or whatever. He doesn't have a lot of time to work on this. But some simple things you can do is first of all, alignment stick along the foot line. But I'll I'll just say this that. A lot of people think if my feet are straight, then I'm in good shape. Well, that's right? the thing is, it's one thing to put the stick down, but yes. it's what, what direction you meant to be aiming at. Right, but the, but the feet are actually not as important as the shoulders and the forearms to get straight. So I found when I put the alignment stick down along my foot line, it, it didn't really help me because it, it, was, it was too close to my body. I needed more of an alignment with where the ball was sitting, right? So I would put alignment sticks out in front of the ball and behind the ball in a straight line to my target. Start off with something pretty easy, maybe you know a 9-iron nine nine or mm -hmm. something like that. And what that helped me was to see that the horizon line, if you like, I sort of see the ball as the horizon line because I'm standing you know, a couple of feet to the, to the side. 
Now I start to picture, oh, that's where the ball should take off. It doesn't take off from my from my eyes. It takes off from, if you like, a metre to the side of where I am. So I think getting alignment six, try them in different positions. Try in front of the ball, maybe five feet out in front of the ball towards the flag stick. If that doesn't work, another thing I like to do is put several balls in a row, about a one foot apart, maybe six or seven balls in a row. So I can actually visualize the ball leaving the leaving the grass or the mat. On its flight path. On on a yeah, yeah. on its well not up in the air, but on the flight yeah. path on the ground, obviously, where the ball would take off over those balls. And that helps me again to get a much better visual representation of where the ball takes off from. Because we think we think it takes off from our eyes, but it doesn't. It takes off from about a metre away from us. So when you haven't got the sticks and you're out playing a game, yep. so what's the story about pick something in front of the ball? Is it yep. six inches in front of the ball? Is it a foot, two two feet? How far in front of the ball do you pick something to sort of line up you know, your target line? I think I think that a little bit of play around with it and see what works best for you. I think that you probably want to be, the longer the shot, you want to pick two or three metres out in front of you. If it's a little chip shot mm-hmm. or a putt even, you can be a few inches in front because, you know, the ball's only rolling yeah. a shorter distance. But if it's a driver, now you're standing a good distance away from the ball, right? So now you need to pick a target maybe two, three, four, even five metres out on the tee box. And the tee is a great spot to do it because often you'll have a ladies marker or a green fee marker or the edge of a tee. You know, especially in America where they have the rough around the edge of the mm. tee, so you can pick, it might be a divot, it might be a big divot that a chopper's made a couple of days prior <laughs> to, <laughs> um, that you can line the ball up and and use that as a starting lineup over the top of it. Does that all make sense to you? Is that is they, they similar things you do, Lucas? Yeah, I actually, I'm actually i actually probably the opposite. I quite like, um, I pretty much, to, to set my alignment once I'm out there, and obviously... I, I don't have a nine to five job in an office, so <laughs> I can spend a lot more time getting my alignment pretty pretty square. But I basically just like to look at the target and then really feel like I just I'll get my body into a position where it feels like it's it's in the right line, and then yep. I feel like I'm ready to go from there. But that's obviously with a lot more practice that I've been able to do that. Now, something that the pros do really well that the amateurs don't is that they will step in and they will almost keep their body open to the target and they'll place the club down yeah, yep. and line the club head up first. Yep. The average punter will jump in there, set his feet, and then and then he'll almost place the club down secondary. Yep. And what that does is when we place our feet first, we tend to over-aim to the right. Nearly everyone, I think 90% of people do that. They place the feet down. And because they're to the side, they're getting their feet aiming at the flag stick. They're way too far to the right. Now they place the club down and they're buggered, right? You're better off to either step in with your right foot and place the club down and try and line the face up with that takeoff line or put your feet close together, dead dead square together, line the club up when you're happy, start to separate your feet and take your alignment Take your stance. At Are that you lining the club up with the the bottom edge of the club? That's a great question because not all clubs are straight and they're a bit rounded and a bit confusing, Correct. aren't they? I think you line the grooves up, Kevin. Um, the grooves need to point, and if you've got a driver where it's rounded, you try to you try to find the centre of that curve as your as your centre of the groove, if, if that makes sense. Some drivers have a line on the top. You can use that, um, which we might talk about putters in a minute. But the bottom groove, I think, is best because the actual bottom iron part is still curved a little bit. It's not dead flat. So I think the grooves are your best bet because they are dead straight. What I do when I well, what I, what I see when I watch the pros and uh, Lucas would do this, and uh, you mentioned before, they they put their right foot forward and they put the club down, yeah, and then they put their left foot for down forward, and then they move the right foot back. Yes. So, yes. I mean, I was watching uh, Jimenez play the other other day in the seniors, and uh, he just lines up quick as a flash, you know, puts the club down, yeah. right foot forward, puts his left foot down, moves his right foot back, and obviously he's, he's aligned. Yeah. And a lot of people, and that's that wriggle because they're uncomfortable, isn't it? They're wriggling around to find. A lot of people say, well, that doesn't feel comfortable. Oh, really? Uh, after uh, five minutes, it doesn't feel comfortable? It takes weeks, even months to get better. The thing is, the more you do it, it takes less and less time 
to get right. As you said, Lucas, at the start, you said you can fix it in a couple of minutes now, right? Well, it's almost like I, I think, it's, you know, like if you look at players out on tour, they they say that you play, you might play your best golf for like two or three weeks a year and then you're going to play some very, very average golf for two or three weeks a year and everywhere, is, everywhere else is somewhere in the middle. I almost think that like your two or three best weeks of golf is when you're actually aimed where you think you are. Mm. Like when you stand there and the first, like the first time you try and line up straight at the flag, it is exactly straight at the flag. Yep. It's almost like if that happens, you're almost like, oh, we're on this week. Like <laughs> how good is this? Every other week, it's almost like, no, that's about that's, three yards left or that's five yep. yards right or whatever. Yeah. You're uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, a little trick for people who aim right is as you walk in and you're coming around to the side of the ball is stop short of the ball. So you're not quite level with the ball yet. So the reason you stop is you're still actually open to the target at this point. You, you then place the club in and then you take your stance. When you aim right, you almost go past the ball, if that makes sense. You yeah, almost yeah. walk past it. Yeah. So a little trick you can try. It'll feel uncomfortable. The ball will feel like it's too close or too far forward. and You'll probably fat a few to start with. But it'll actually help your swing path too. Instead of that over the top to pull it back, you'll start to create a different path from the alignment change. It's interesting, uh, Craig, uh, when you, you mentioned the word there, being comfortable. My mm. wife took up golf about uh, 18 months ago and uh, she'll line up and she'll aim to the right. Yep. And, uh, and I'll say, look, you're aiming too far to the right. You know, you've got to hit it straight into the lake over there. You know, you've got to come around quite a lot. And she says, but it's not comfortable. <laughs> it's not comfortable. I, I feel more comfortable doing it this way. Yep. So that's, that, I suppose that's something you've got to overcome in, in your mind. That, yep. But maybe what is uncomfortable is, is actually correct. But, <laughs> yes. but because you've been incorrect all your life or you just started off as a learner, yep. y- you can't get it through into your head. And the reality is that if you aim right, you will develop a swing path yes. to match the, lo- the, the aim, yeah. right? So if I change your aim, you have to change your swing path or else you're going to hit it 40 metres to the left like you used to, mm. or, or except right. you used to pull it back to the target. Mm. So that's the uncomfortableness is you actually have to change your swing a little bit when you fix your alignment. Now, an easier place to fix alignment is on the putting green because obviously... First of all, you can line the ball up at the hole. I mean, it should be cheating, really. You can put an actual black straight line on the ball, get the ball on the green, and line your eyes up directly behind in line with your target, if it's a straight putt, right? That way, now you know that ball on the, that line on the ball is aiming straight where you're aiming. Then you've got a line on your putter. So you can now match the line on the ball to the line on your putter, get your feet square and you're right to go. But a lot of people struggle with that even. They, I, I try to help them line the, the putter up with the ball and they just can't. That Their eyes just don't see it from side on angle. They just don't see it very well. And that's how this conversation started last week, KB, is that was, I was playing golf last week and you're playing with your playing partners and you know that the, the ball's not going to go in the hole the way they line up. It, and that they think they're lining up properly and they're, they're not even close. But it's amazing how you get a different perspective when you get in in behind the ball to putt it compared to when you're watching from a distance, watching your mate just completely stuff it up. But isn't that why, Lucas and, and Craig, that uh, you know you look at some little point in front of the ball to the hole or where you think you want to hit the ball because it might have a bit of fall yep. and uh, you have the, the, the marking on the ball and then you line that up and then all you have to do is you know get the club head square to that, that line on the ball and, and it should go and some sort of close direction. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what I've found, KB, is that certain people, if you gave them one of the old-style centre shaft to cushion it putters, you know, the skinny ones, yep. the, they would really struggle with that because it doesn't have enough markings. But you give them a mallet putter with these, you know, say the two-ball Callaway, now they've got a better chance because they can line the, the two balls and the ball that you're actually putting with straight in a line. straight line, right? There's also a lot of different Scotty Cameron style putters. So so and they all have putters in different parts of their club head. So some have the the line right on the edge of the face. Some have it further back further back on the mallet so that you can sort of um, separate where the ball and the line is. I, I think and, and then you've got different center shaft versus offset versus tremendously offset. And all of those things can make a difference. Um, it might cost a little bit of money to <laughs> try a few different putters out and see if that helps. So, Lucas, you're, you're one of the best putters there is in Australia. When you line up for your putt, 
are you what are you all focusing on is it is it just your head position is it your hands is it your feet is it everything what because you know that's one thing that you do so well um <laughs> i'm really probably not going to help spencey's tip here cuz um look I, I try and take a lot of the noise out of it um myself like i think golf's probably one of the most difficult sports because we have so much time to think um and especially over a putt we have so much time to think about you know if i'm at 8 feet that i know that well, if I miss this, I'm going to lose half a shot on the field. Or if I know this is for birdie, so if I miss this, I've lost an easy chance to make a birdie for the. And there's there's so many chances to think about this. Whereas I'm sure KB, you would know with playing football or Whitey, even with cricket, like you just see it and hit it, or you see it and kick mm-hmm. it. And you know if you grab the ball 30 out on the angle, like you just you just snap it and you don't even think about like you just think where the goals are. You don't think oh what if this misses or anything like that. So I tend to I tend to keep it quite simple. I, don't, I actually don't use a line on my ball. I like to keep it really blank. Um, I, I put it down so that I can't see anything on the ball. Um, and I just pick a spot out, um, usually about two-thirds of the way down the putt that I want to see the ball roll over. Mm-hmm. And just trying to keep all the noise out of it and just think about rolling the ball over that spot. And, um, yeah, just go back to, like, that that football theory or the, the cricket theory. Like, you'd, you, everyone pretty much with their instincts is good enough just to hit it over... You know, if you gave them a putter and gave them one second to hit it one-handed, they'd probably hit it straight over the spot you wanted. But if they took all this time to line up and get everything spot on, they end up, you know, thinking about it too much and hit, and hitting it all over the place. So I, yeah, as much as the noise out of it, no, I can, no, it's good. Just keep it, keep it simple. Hit it over that spot, um, and you know, trust all the work that I've done practice-wise beforehand. Um, that you know, if it goes in, awesome. If it doesn't, well, you know, I'm not going to make them all. You had a question for Craig about Greg Norman. Oh yes, well, I, I we, we, should, we shouldn't well, we shouldn't not have well, this. Well, Craig, uh, when done, Craig yeah. first came to the studio, uh, because Greg Norman uh, was beaten by Craig uh, magnificently in the Masters, uh, absolutely killed the great man. But I noticed recently that uh, Greg is very keen at getting his gear off, <laughs> and I just thought uh, every time he posts, uh, you know, a tweet with his gear off, you should post one back with your gear off and say, <laughs> "I'm the man that beat him in the Masters." <laughs> you know, go go nude body for nude body. <laughs> Yeah, and he said the other day he's got to live to his 110, so he got plenty of time. Have you seen me with my gear off before, uh, KB? You may not. Do you reckon his six-pack is a little bit better? He does but look good, doesn't he? He looks, he looks in great, great condition. He want, how long does he want to live? 143 110, he said. 110. 110. Yeah. 108 or 110. I'm not quite sure the difference <laughs> of the two years. He's got the money to do it. <laughs> He's an interesting character now. I tell you what, one thing I admire, he never sits still, does he? I mean, he's doing something every day with his shirt off traditionally, but he's doing <laughs> something every day. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Look, okay, thanks for coming along. We appreciate it. If you want to get a lesson with Craig Spencer, uh, all you got to do is do it in Melbourne here at the Albert Park at Driving Range. We'll uh, catch you again next week. Craig and Lucas, thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. It's been oh. fantastic to have you in, and uh, good luck for the Australian Summer of Golf. Thank you. And KB, thank you. Great being part of it uh, with two great golfers. I've learned a lot today. Absolutely. We'll do it all again Thanks, next KB. week Thanks, on Adam. the PJ Golf Club. Yeah. 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 PJ Golf Club. Yeah.